Welcome to The Brainstorm, episode 60. We're going to be talking about what everyone thinks we're talking about. Not Apple, Replit. But then we'll get to Apple. Of course, we'll talk about Apple. But we've got we've got Joseph with us to talk about, uh, I think, probably the biggest news over the last week, which is Replit Agent. Um, can you explain to everyone what, one, what Replit is for those who don't know, and then two, what Replit Agent is and why it's making waves? Yeah, sure thing. So Replit is a coding platform that's seeking to uh, democratize access to coding environments, make it much easier to spin up your own projects uh, and to share them with others. And as part of that platform, they've recently introduced their own coding agent, which is far more developed than many of the coding agents that we've seen so far. So up to this point, most coding agents work pretty closely with developers, making inline suggestions in a development environment that a software dev would have set up. Uh, or if you want more comprehensive coding suggestions, or if you want something to try to create a full app, typically you'd wind up copy pasting code suggestions from something like uh, ChatGPT or uh, Anthropic's Claude 3.5 model. Uh, but last week, uh, as you said, Replit introduced Replit Agent, uh, which is a coding agent that's capable of creating web apps uh, more comprehensively and autonomously. Um, so instead of asking for uh, a suggestion for a specific function in your code, this can create um, a, a full-on web app, something like uh, a software page or a, um, uh, a landing page for a startup, say, that can count the number of subscribers that you have. Uh, people have been using it things, uh, for things like uh, ad spend monitoring as well, apps that can do that. Um, and it's, it's doing the back end associated with those as well. Um, which right now there's only a, a handful of coding agents that are actually trying to create full applications autonomously uh, with, with Raplets being one of them. Um, and this is quite a bit harder than what we've seen other agents try to do as well, right? Because it has to have the understanding and tooling necessary to set up a development environment, uh, download and install packages, ask for API keys, set up the back end. Uh, it's a bit more complex. Where does this rank in terms of other products on the market? Um, are there other coding agents out there? And is Replits better, different, the same? What's going on? Yeah, I would say in terms of the things that are generally available right now, uh, this is definitely one of the one of the best products that's out there. Um, uh, in, in terms of kind of, like I said, its ability to try to tackle a project comprehensively on its own. Uh, as part of the process, it'll ask for feedback from the user, so it's not fully solo, um, but uh, it, it seems to be sort of the best option right now if you want to spin up a web app pretty quickly. Uh, there are other products that are creating apps more end-to-end. -end. So Amazon has App Studio, which is currently in preview, uh, and that's their platform for using natural language to create apps within uh, AWS um, uh, more easily. Um, and, uh, and we've also seen products like uh, Amazon QStar, there's of course GitHub Copilot, GitLab Duo, uh, that are all kind of trending in this direction as well, or um, sort of in more private prototypes have some capabilities like this too. And what's Replit charging for it? So right now it's included in Replit's team and enterprise subscriptions. Um, or their, excuse me, they call it their core and their team subscriptions. Uh, I think their core is $10 a month, so it would be included within that. Uh, and then the team's pricing is, is more available on request and uh, is slightly more catered to the size of the organization and things like that, I believe. But um, this is, it's, it's a good point to bring up because these agents are a good opportunity for startups like Replit to monetize more seriously. Uh, the CEO of Replit actually tweeted out not too long ago that they're probably going to raise prices pretty soon uh, in response to the increased value that, that these agents are providing uh, and just the platform as a whole. And we're seeing that general trend as, as these uh, models become more agentic. It's, it's a good opportunity for these startups to kind of take advantage of uh, not only the increased functionality, but the increased integration that they can have with, with workflows to make those products a lot stickier and, and something you can charge for over time. I think Brett tweeted out, he said, you know, original thesis, everyone codes on Replit, new thesis, Replit codes for everyone. Right, exactly. And have you had the chance to test it? 
Uh, I've not, no. Uh, but we do have a few Rapid Power users here at Arc that I think are are excited to do so pretty soon. Right now, right now the product's on uh, on a, a wait list, I believe. Got it. Got it. All right. Should we should we jump over to Apple now? And uh, Nick, you wanna? What? You're you're uh, the fan favorite for Apple hot takes here. What what did you think? Maybe the hot take is there is no hot take. I think we saw a lot of what they showed yesterday in their prior announcement earlier this year. Um, not a lot of hardware improvements, in my opinion. I think it's you know typical Apple, smaller or thinner, lighter, better battery, uh, and it's incremental improvements uh, to each iteration of hardware. I think their positioning is this next generation of hardware is being purpose-built for generative AI. So they talked about the different internal components of the new smartphone and how it is geared towards being able to better process uh, these generative AI models locally. Um, I think what we're going to see is their increased emphasis on generative AI, so Apple intelligence. I think the only bit of new information we got around Apple intelligence was just the vision capability. So the new smartphone iPhone 16 will now come with a dedicated camera button. That's about as uh, big of a leap Apple has ever made in a iteration of a, 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 a new piece of hardware. Uh, and in the camera functionality, you'll be able to point and ask questions about the world that is being captured by the camera. So uh, there is some of that functionality already out with Meta and their Ray-Ban glasses. Um, they have rolled out a lot of this capability. Apple's now rolling that out into the phone itself. Um, I think that is interesting and unique. Uh, is the phone the best device to be able to do that? Probably not. But I think because everyone has one in their pocket, it will probably catch on. Ultimately, I think a lot of that functionality would be better suited in a pair of glasses or AirPods with cameras, um, different ways to do this. But Apple's definitely going for it with AI. Um, that was really the heart of the presentation yesterday. You know, this was a hardware announcement, but it definitely leans software focused. Um, depending on how you want to look at the rollout of this, you know, these phones are launching or available September 20th. Um, but you won't have access to the early beta of Apple Intelligence until October. And then a lot of features are still going to be closed off until the end of the year. So probably some internal testing here, some of the functionality not quite being ready, and Apple wanting to slow roll and see how users approach this because it's very different. I think if you think about the install base, Apple has a billion plus users this will be the largest deployment of AI we've seen to date. You know, every other company outside of the other mega techs that have launched uh, generative AI tools have, you know, had to start from the ground up. So going direct to consumer from nothing is a lot different than going direct to consumer with a billion plus install base. So we'll see how this plays out. Um, but you can definitely see that, you know, they want to be in the conversation when it comes to AI. That's right. And if you're in Europe, sorry. You're out of luck. Uh, yeah. but Nick, Thank you, regulators. What, one other small thing that was incorporated into AirPods that made me think of what you'd been saying was the uh, nod nod gestures, right? Because you were saying, you know, with Meta's glasses or anything like that, you know, the whole privacy issue or no one wants to be talking that, that much in public. It's like, I think that that's kind of a novel small thing but i was like hmm, that's a nice little user experience uh yeah yeah no that's a good point i think they even are now allowing you to text directly to siri for that same you know the, behind the same reasoning of you know there are going to be queries or searches that you want to ask a generative ai agent that you want it to be private and you know we don't spend all that much time or you know 
you know, you are in public for a good portion of your day, most people if you're working and commuting. Um, so being able to do that in privacy, you still need to have text. Um, and then, you know, if this does make its way to ancillary devices like AirPods, introducing new form factors and user experiences are definitely ne necessary for this to catch on broadly. And then Joseph, do you have an Apple Watch or an iPhone? I have an iPhone. Um, yeah, the Apple Watch. I know there's the sleep apnea update, which is cool. I feel like they're definitely leaning into health, uh, but otherwise the updates. I don't have an Apple Watch. Nick, I know you're a Garmin, a Garmin man. Yeah, I think battery life is very important to me. So the idea of having to charge a uh, Apple Watch every day or two, non-starter for me versus my Garmin which also doesn't have a lot of smartwatch capability beyond just the fitness tracking is, you know, I get two weeks of battery life with this. So very happy Garmin user. Um, I do like your point, Sam, around them leaning into health and making the device more of a core piece of that story. Um, you know, they also introduced a hearing test with AirPods. I think the next generation of AirPod Max, no, Pro, has the ability to also act as a hearing aid, which is quite interesting. Um, they're also allowing you to now send a uh, visual or capture picture or video and send that to a 911 operator if you make a call to them, which I thought was interesting. So definitely trying to make it more of an integral part of emergency and health, which is, I think, a logical step given how broadly these devices are used. I mean, that is your window into the digital world. So it makes sense to continue to push into that area. And, and to that point, they're branching out their use of uh, satellites as well to enable all their phones to use satellite text in, in emergency conditions too. Yep. Back to AI though, I think there is an important story here, which is, you know, if these mega tech companies are slow rolling the launch of their broader products within generative AI. Does that open a window? I'll, I'll ask this question to both of you. Does that open a window for newer entrants into the space to you know, disrupt? Or is this a uh, potential you know, slowdown in the space itself and we should be taking cues from how slow these you know incumbents are willing to adopt some of these services and roll them out to you know very large user bases yeah i'll i'll, I'll kick it off i think that there's there's a degree to which this is kind of slowing down a little bit on the enterprise level and i think that's also reflected in apple's approach here where they want to make sure that they implement these products as safely as possible in a way that protects their reputation so I do think there's a degree to which enterprises and then consumer facing companies like Apple are taking a slower approach in general. Um, and I think that some of these companies can afford to do so if they have a massive data advantage or a distribution advantage that can buy them that time. Um, I do think for a lot of products though, I mean, just kind of going back to what we were talking about with Agentic AI, uh, I think as some of these coding agents democratize access to, to software development and make it easier for people to create their own custom software, I do think that poses a threat to some uh, SaaS enterprises that maybe need to move quickly if they're going to uh, outrun the pace at which smaller, uh, smaller, nimbler companies can replicate their products. Yeah. Yeah. Sam. I think, well, I think this is like the whole, is it sustaining versus disruptive innovation type debate? And it's like, Apple could in theory, move faster, but realistically they can't. And it's not smart for their business model to do that. And then I think that's inherently what makes, you know, this AI somewhat disruptive is it's moving so quickly that that's the window of opportunity for someone small to come in, compete orthogonally and gain some adoption. And then I feel like the, you know, the dynamics always exist as you said, distribution, if they're, it's hard to undermine a company that's got a billion users, but 
that's it's always hard and yet somehow it always happens so i don't think apple can just rest on its laurels i do think there's a window of opportunity for creative fast moving companies here um and at the same time you know giants giants are hard to kill yeah i guess the news twist to the sustain versus disruption is more in thinking about just the productization of these models and have we reached some sort of local minimum of you know we've seen the different llm wrapper companies come out on the creative side for consumers on the enterprise side you have you know broad sweeping uh you know, changes in, in how companies are going to adopt this. In thinking about how Apple, Microsoft, and Google, Meta are approaching this, more so have they, you know, are are they running up against the wall in terms of what they can actually release and and uh, to consumers where it is, you know, bordering on maybe too much or, or too little, I guess is how I'm thinking about it. You know, Apple's being very... Uh, intentional in the products that they're actually allowing with Apple intelligence. Like they're kind of cherry picking different use cases to introduce to individuals instead of just handing over kind of a more generic or generalizable model for everyone to play around with. Um, I think it's interesting. Yeah. Maybe we'll circle back in two weeks after OpenAI releases its newest model rumored and, and see if there's uh, any plateau or if it knocks people's socks off. And I feel like just, you know, as we're talking about that same time, Oracle's talking about gigawatt data centers. Elon with XAI, you know, said they spun up the 100,000 H100s in four months. So that's faster than really anyone thought possible. So there's certainly still acceleration and uh, ambition. So we'll, we'll have to see if there is any plateau in performance. Performance or product, right? Or product. I think that's the, de- right? Because we've right, had right. this debate. Is it really that impressive to just keep beating benchmarks if you can't actually productize the usefulness of these models Agreed. and have consumers willing to pay? I think that's where I was trying to get to, but I was probably fumbling around my words. Well, you, you got apologies to I, everyone I, for having to listen to that train of thought, but that is why this is a brainstorm. I no, I, I think that's a great point. Give us products. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. All, right. All right. Well, that's let's, the show. Let's leave it there. And yeah. uh, another two weeks, I think a lot more will be out there. Some new products to test, some new pricing information likely. Uh, that'll all be interesting. Joseph, thanks for joining us. Thanks, thanks, for thanks Joseph. Me. Thanks, everyone.